Hey, Scott Jennings here. Thanks for listening to the Flyover Country podcast. Really excited about this week's special guest, Mary Catherine Hamm. She's a noted conservative commentator. She's seen been on a lot of different uh, cable networks. She and I have worked together uh, on CNN uh, over the years, and I have an enormous amount of respect for Mary Catherine. Uh, first of all, let me tell you where you can find her. Uh, she is at MK Hammer on Twitter and MK Hammer Time on Instagram. She has a new Substack, which I just personally subscribe to, called MK Hammer Time. So if you go to Substack and look at MK Hammer Time, really good value for the kind of writing uh, that Mary Catherine does. She's a terrific writer and tells a lot of great stories about uh, politics and being a mom and being a parent and just different cultural issues. I think you'll find all of her writing quite interesting. She also has her own podcast called Getting Hammered, uh, which is a great name <laughs> when you... Uh, uh, when you listen to it, you'll you'll love it uh, as much uh, as you love her writing, which I have followed for many years. So Mary Catherine Ham is the guest on this week's Flyover Country podcast. We covered the waterfront, talked about a lot of issues related to COVID and schools and our current state of our media and our politics. And I really did enjoy having Mary Catherine. So enjoy it. Flyover Country with Scott Jennings and special guest Mary Catherine Ham starts right now. Attention passengers, we ask that you please fasten your seatbelts at this time and secure all baggage underneath your seat or in the overhead compartments. Flyover Country with Scott Jennings is prepared for takeoff. All right, you're on the Flyover Country podcast. Scott Jennings here, and I am so pleased with the show this week because my favorite person from television which there's a lot of people on television, so this is a, a high honor. Mary Catherine Ham is with us. Mary Catherine, thank you for being with us today. Hello, I'm so glad to be here. That was this is so profesh. I know, it's very profesh. Scott. I know. We got it's is amazing. We we've been slowly upgrading our technological capabilities, and the first uh, episode we did was just me and uh, Jake Tapper and two cups and a string. So we're we're now uh, well beyond that, and nice. uh, and we've had some great we've had some great conversations, and I. I was so glad that you uh, were able to make time for us uh, today because I was just telling the guys that of all the people on TV and all the people sort of in our conservative media space, before I do anything, I almost always check the Mary Catherine Twitter feed or whatever you just did to make sure I'm tracking in the correct direction because I never find myself watching you and saying, I disagree with everything she just said. We should do something else. And I almost always find myself saying, that's the that's the right answer. So no, it's good. It's and not to make this a mutual appreciation podcast, but it's good to have you around because I feel like we're very. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we there, there's a, I, I feel what I enjoy about your commentary is that and, and I've seen you talk about this a little bit, but you have this contrarian streak in you that I identify with. I yes. like, but I think is. But for some reason in politics today, no one appreciates contrarians anymore. Like you have to adhere to this puritanical whoever setting whoever setting the puritanical guidelines of the day if you if you're a contrarian you're out and and you've experienced this too but i i feel like americans like we're we are contrarians i mean most americans we we appreciate contrarianism but it's being stamped out i don't know if you feel that way but i i do no, I, I definitely do. In fact, this is why I go to college campuses as often as possible, because, I mean, it's so easy to be a contrarian on college campuses. And uh, one of the things I teach students is that you should want to be the weirdo in the room sometimes and that rooms need weirdos because ideas need to be tested. And if you're not testing them, then uh, you're going to be lazy and you're you're not going to have the best arguments for what you believe in. Yeah, you and I find ourselves often on on cable television panels in which I often find you go around sort of the table and and you have a bunch of people who ultimately are just saying the same thing and what I find lacking in those conversations sometimes is just one person, one person who's willing right. to say, "Well, you know, maybe if this, this had happened or maybe if the per, you know, right. and and um and even if even if you don't fully subscribe to that idea yourself, just the concept of it being discussed so we can flesh it out. Yes. But I think a lot of people are afraid, frankly, to be that person because then, you know, you get a whole bunch of people coming after you. And you do. And that that can be unpleasant. Uh, but I do think it's worth not just voicing what I genuinely believe when it ha like I'm not just taking a contrary position because it's fun. I, I happen to be outnumbered in general in this town and, and in my job. Uh, so that's where I'm fairly comfortable. But also, if I don't actually believe the thing, but I know that there's a giant group of people who do, 
I will try to voice that because I think it's important that they have a seat at a table, uh, even if I'm not exactly that person. And so I do think there's the bubble problem is very real. And people in this town and in this business often don't know that a giant chunk of people have this belief (laughs) and until you bring it to the table for them. Yeah, I think um, uh, a lot of people focus on on commentary in general. Well, do we have enough Republicans or do we have enough Democrats? And I think the least disgusting, but perhaps the most important thing is, do we have enough people who aren't from Washington, D.C., New York City, Los Angeles, or, you know, this sort of the urban corridor? Because, you know, you're from a small town. I'm from a small town. There's a whole bunch of people out between the coasts who experience issues and see things a lot differently than the the folks who live in these in these bubbles, and and I don't and I don't mean the partisan bubbles. I just mean the government bubble yes. or the urban. No, I bubble. think you're right. I think you're. I think that might be the larger divide, uh, and it, it's, it's it correlates with blue and red, but it's not al- always just red and blue. Um, and I think the the pandemic has been a perfect example, has really crystallized that because there's sort of parallel pandemics, as I call call them, because my family in North Carolina and friends in Georgia experienced this very differently than we did right outside uh, Washington, D.C. You know, it's interesting. I I was discussing this with um, someone the other day that here in Kentucky, um, you know, you rare. I mean, occasionally, it depends on where you go, but you occasionally see people in masks. Most of the time you don't. And you haven't for quite some time. You know, where you run into it mostly is at school. I have four kids in three schools. Two of them have to wear masks at school. Two of them don't. I mean, it, it makes no sense. But but for professionally, for me, right. I haven't really run into any restrictions or, you know, problems. However, this semester, I started going back to Harvard to do my class. So I have to get tested every time I step on campus. I have to wear one of the giant masks on my face and scream into that for three hours on a Monday night. When I go to CNN, I have to take a test before they'll let me on the set. So the only time in two years I've I've ever sort of run into any static was when I go to Washington, D.C. or Cambridge, Massachusetts, or the airport, yeah. everywhere else here in Kentucky. And so I think your point is is interesting. And when we look back on this period, a lot of people are going to have very different memories of this because of where they live. Children in particular will yeah. have very different memories, I think. Uh, and that's that's the thing I think that's coming coming to bear now in the last month or so that I've been yelling about for a while and that others have been yelling about for a while, which is why do we treat the least at risk population with the most restrictions. Uh, it is unfair to children who had a large parts of their life just sort of snatched out from under them in 2020, uh, including just the ability in some places to greet people on the street or make friends at a park. I remember the first time I told my kids, and this was very early uh, in the first couple of weeks of the pandemic, I was like, you know, people are a little skittish. You guys don't need to be afraid because we focused very much on making sure that they weren't living scared because I knew that it wasn't a giant risk to them because of their age. So they're like, you guys aren't at risk. We need to be a little more careful with grandparents. Um, We can do things outside, but just be careful with other folks in the neighborhood because we don't know exactly what their comfort level is. And my children, I know this will surprise you, Scott, are very social. They (laughs) want to make friends with everyone that they meet. And so the first time I told them that, they're like, "Uh, excuse me, we don't go to parks and not meet strangers. That's insane. Uh, And (laughs) That sounds like my parenting is very bad, by the way. It's not. It's okay. Um, But I think that a lot of kids lived in that very isolated style for the greater part of two years in a lot of metro areas. And that is that's real problematic. Uh, And school was taken from them as well. And that's one a fight that we've been fighting in this area just just to get schools back open. It took a year. It it, uh, this whole uh, conversation you're starting about how we've treated children, what what has been the most galling, I think, to, to many of us is that we knew for a long time what we were doing to the schools and what we were doing to the kids was wrong. It was unsupported mm-hmm. by the data and the science. You know, that became the great term, the science. And yet it became religion for a, a lot of people on the left that we had to do this. We had to do this. I think it's pretty clear right. that the Biden administration was heavily influenced by teachers unions more than they were mm-hmm. scientists. And I think we started to see this manifest itself politically uh, in the Virginia election last year. So As we get to this year's midterm as a political analysis matter, by the time we get to the midterm, you know, this will be more of a memory. I mean, we should have fewer restrictions by then. But do you think voters 
uh, are going to remember who did this to them and punish them accordingly? Or do you think it's going to be, you know, we're going to forget about it at some point? I did not used to be confident that anyone would be punished for this. Uh, but in the run up to the Virginia election, I thought the 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 pessimist in me was like, oh, gosh, like Terry McAuliffe is just going to get elected and everything's going to be the same. And they're going to shut down schools again for a new surge as soon as it's November. And then I thought to myself, but they closed schools for a year. They closed schools for a year. You cannot do that and expect people not to react. Uh, and a lot of Democratic uh, analysts or people who were more left leaning kept saying like, no, everything's going to go as planned here. It's Terry McAuliffe. Glenn Youngkin has no chance. And I thought, but you've really messed with people, like really deeply messed with people. And I kept seeing in my in my groups of mom friends who are not terribly political, uh, I have some army mom friends who are generally center right, uh, a handful of liberals among them, other mom friends who are just not super engaged. They were all engaged. Uh, yeah. and they were, they were based, they were red pilled <laughs> yeah. and it was, and it was by the schools. And I think the, the, the nail in the coffin for Terry McAuliffe was that he brought Randy Weingarten to town. And I jokingly tweeted that he should bring her to stump for him. And then, and then he, he did. Actually did. <laughs> he did it. I, I couldn't believe the gift, but, um, moms around here, parents around here, moms are the ones that I'm buddies with, but parents around here knew that she was the culprit. And that's the thing that is different than it used to be. A lot of parents around here are like, I didn't, I'd never thought about teachers unions before. And now I have a lot of thoughts and they're not good thoughts and they know who they're aligned with. Now, does that expand to other restrictions as well? Look, if you don't have kids uh, and you've gotten through the pandemic with like a relatively low level of annoyance, uh, then, you know, maybe it's not the end of the world for you, but if you're a business owner or a parent or somebody who's been deeply affected by the restrictions, as opposed to just the virus, because those are two different yeah. consequences that we're looking at. Yeah, I think you go out and vote for an alternative. And I think a lot of people here, because Glenn Youngkin signaled, I'm okay for you to vote for, guys. I'm not the guy that they're telling you that I am. The fleece vest is safe. Uh, he signaled that successfully and smartly. And a lot of people crossed over and it was because of this. It, it, they, they were messed with and they were messed with in a, in a very real way. And the unions have so much hubris that they just thought everything would be fine. Yeah. And the continuation of the voting patterns in San Francisco when they had the recall election the other day, mm -hmm. I think are, are further confirmation that if if the if the people of a town like that are so exercised about what's happened that they're willing to go out and toss out school board members. Imagine what people, you know, from Dayton or, yes. <laughs> you know, Louisville, or, I mean, well, the, people from normal towns, I mean, politically, right. you know, normal towns are going right, to right. do. Well, there, there's a great um, anecdote from the San, San Francisco Chronicles uh, coverage of the recall where one of the activists, I can't remember his, his given name, but he calls himself Gabraham Lincoln. <laughs> and he went uh, to the celebration of the recall success dressed in head to toe rainbow, you know, platform shoes, the whole deal. And, a reporter asked him why, you know, why are you here? And, and he said, well, th this, this look in particular is to show people, because I know the argument is going to be, these are all Republicans. These are all conservative, the secret conservatives of San Francisco running this movement. And they're going to say it's dark Republican money. It's Republican people. But I want them to know that this movement is diverse and that I am part of it. Now, here's the problem for Democrats. It's true that the movement is diverse, but if that movement due to Democrats demonizing of it, is solely identified with the Republican Party, that's a problem for Democrats. Yeah. That's a real big problem. And you shouldn't have put yourself in that position. Well, you, you, uh, you're you you leading me to my next question about strategy. And it seems to me that Democrat governors are starting to wake up to the problems they have with their own populations. But it's less clear to me that Joe Biden is waking up to the problems he has with his own approval rating because of of the way people view his uh, actions on COVID, among other things. He's got a big opportunity coming up with the State of the Union to recalibrate how he talks about this. My belief is he should pivot hard and burn a mask at the rostrum and say this is over. <laughs> but I think he has a problem, and that is there is a significant percentage of his base, the, the hardest core people who turned out to throw out Donald Trump and to elect him that don't want him to do that. In fact, they want him to keep on forever. And right. I am less certain that he's figured out yet how to 
keep those people happy while satisfying what he must know is a is a prevailing opinion in the country that we got to move past this. What what is your advice if you put your strategist head on? Right. What's your advice for him? I mean, if if you were him right now and you've got this massive speech, how would you tackle it? Uh, well, I would tell him first and foremost, I think we've seen it all over the country. There is a giant constituency for normalcy. Yeah, there just is. Uh, and there's a reason for that because th- the past two years haven't been great. And if you, uh, and if you campaigned on getting normalcy back, both in sort of the regular Washington way of doing business, instead of being, uh, shall we say more, more, uh, less, less tight lipped and, uh, and disciplined like our former president, uh, Trump, if you campaigned on that, plus the normalcy of sort of owning this virus and getting it under control, uh, then you need to show progress toward that. Uh, and I, I think there was a chance in summer of 2021 where that was possible. And obviously things changed when Delta came along, then Omicron came along. However, I think while those changes were going on with a little bit of momentum and people feeling some promise, instead of just tripling down on all the mitigation measures that we had tried and the sort of inflationary throwing money at the problem that yeah. we had tried and hadn't really been victorious with, uh, as illustrated by these waves that came along afterwards. Um, he should have gone a different direction then. Is there a chance to pivot now? Look, I think pivoting is better than not pivoting. Uh, however, this may have gone on too long and be too identified with his base and with him to sort of climb down from it. And like you said, whoo, the people who are very married to mitigation measures are very married to them and they are going to be upset. And I think a little bit of it is that they're genuinely nervous about the virus, which is, look, it's a real thing. I've never said it's not a risk. It's just that we have treated everyone as if they have the same risk profile. And so a lot of people are more scared of it than they likely need to be. And that makes climbing down from some of these things very difficult. This is this is one of the, the most curious things about this whole pandemic is that as Americans and as parents, uh, we all sort of make risk decisions every day. You know, do you let your kid play football? Do you let your yeah. kid swim in a pool? Do you let your kid go walk down the street to visit his friend and you don't walk him down there? I mean, there's, you make these risk decisions every day. But it was like when this started – our ability to to make these risk decisions just flew out the window. And I, I've been trying to figure out why. And I guess the most obvious explanation is, is that the media essentially had us all looking at this through a bit of a distorted, it was a funhouse mirror. You know, we, yes. but what they told us about it and the alarmist nature of it in some quarters was so distorting that it, it distorted our own judgment. But at this point, it seems like more and more people are filtering that out and and now they have enough information to make to sort of go back to where we were, which is smart people right. who can make who can make uh, risk well, tolerance decisions. I'm glad you bring this up, Scott. This is a <laughs> hobby horse of mine. Yes, uh, I I wrote for the Atlantic about this and about uh, basically we shouldn't ask kids to be resilient for adults. Right, adults should should make we should make policy based on risk analysis and be adults about it, uh, which is not something that we've been doing particularly well. Now, at the very beginning of the pandemic. Right. It made sense for everyone to take more precautions because we weren't exactly sure what we were dealing with. Now, I would argue that very early on, we knew that it affected old people more than young and outside was safer than inside. And yet, what did we do? Well, in New York, we threw a bunch of and other states, we threw a bunch of old folks into old folks homes with covid. And then we closed the parks. Great job, guys. Uh, However, look, in that time, there's a grace period. I understood that we didn't quite understand what we were dealing with. So it was stay home, stay safe. But stay home, stay safe does not allow you to make a risk analysis about where you are, about what your profile is, what your health is, how this might affect you. And in fact, we demonized personal risk analysis. Yeah, we did. We told people, we told people that if you were doing personal risk analysis, you were killing your grandma. That's right. Which, look, bad things happen with a virus. Viruses spread. Uh, but to demonize the act of making sort of rational choices for you and your family was a big mistake. And it led people to uh, get out of practice at doing this thing that we all have to do. Uh, it led them to distort one risk at the uh, at the expense of all these other ones. We, we focused on one risk and we left the field open for a thousand others, which is what you're seeing with young people and increased mental illness issues. And the years 
of learning loss that we are going to be dealing with uh, in the areas where schools were closed. That wasn't wise. No. And we could have done it in a more wise way. Uh, and now I think people are out of practice making risk analyses. And you see it, as you, your point about the media, the number of columns I see by moms whose either children get COVID or there's, they've kept them isolated for two years so that they won't get COVID, there's, the tone is so panicky. Yes. It is, uh, it is not proportional to the risk. Unless, unless you have a very immunocompromised child, young children are largely very safe. I know it's not exciting for your kid to get COVID and I know people are worried about long COVID, but largely you are, if you're writing one of these columns, you're definitely overestimating the risk to your child. And then other moms and dads are reading that column and thinking, oh my gosh, is this where I need to be? And the answer is probably no, probably no, that's not where you need to be. And by the way, we got COVID in this house in, in late December, January, finally it came for us. And, uh, and I have three young children. I didn't even test them. I'm sure it ran through them. It was, it was break. Uh, so they weren't really exposed to anybody or going to school. And, um, and I had a newborn. Now, if I, there's two choices. I could have written a column about how I triple masked around my baby, uh, because I, you know, I had to breastfeed her and this is, this is the price that we pay for being badly behaved during COVID. (laughs) Uh, and I could have, you know, put her in another room and slid notes to her under the door. What nonsense I could have written, right? About how I isolated my child during COVID. I didn't do that because I understand the risk to her is very low. But which column would sell? Right. Like if I wrote the, if I wrote the column about how we just treated this like it was an illness for the children like we would treat a lot of other right. illnesses. That column doesn't probably get a slot. No. No. So that's a problem because that distorts people's view of this. Yeah, it's um, it, it's interesting that you see a lot of the columns you referenced. And then also on top of that, you see people, and I don't know why this is, but the, the people running schools, uh, the story that sticks with me from the last few weeks that I, I just couldn't believe were the school in California where they took the kids whose parents sent them to school with no masks because that was mm-hmm. okay. And then they barricaded them in the room. It was a cold day. They turned the thermostat down. They put the tables right. in front of the door. So you have this sort of um, coalition of the panicky, you know, panic stricken parent. And then you have the the people in the schools who are all too willing to be the the enforcers of this panic. And it it, it really is a a bizarre group of people, but they have such an outsized influence on our discourse on this and then directly on the kid's life. And, uh, you know, I've got a a six year old. He's in kindergarten. And uh, so he doesn't really remember going to preschool without a mask. He's been going to kindergarten with a mask. They recently lifted the mask mandates here. He still has to wear it on the bus, but he doesn't have to wear it when he gets to school. I guess that's a federal issue. Yeah. That's a transportation issue. I was trying, I was trying to explain to him the other day, like when you get to school, you can take the mask off. And I could tell he was nervous about doing it because he was concerned about what other people were going to say. And it, it makes me wonder these people who've had, I think completely distorted views of this, they've been put in a position to really shape our children's worldview apart from what their parents might want. And I wonder what the long-term implications of that are. Well, yeah. And there, there's several layers of that in these school board fights, right? There's, there's some discussion about whether this is about the school board fights and the, the parent revolt are about um, CRT, uh, critical race theory being taught in schools or other, other content being taught that parents don't like, or if it's about the closed schools. And on that, on that front, it's, it's sequential. When you when you close schools for a year, you get away with less nonsense. Yeah. You can put some nonsense in there if you're running a functional school. You can't put nonsense in there uh, once parents start tuning in. They're going to every school board meeting because they would like their children to go to school. And then they start noticing what you're doing. And if what you're doing is renaming schools and taking merit-based uh, metrics out of schools, they will get upset with you because those are not the things they think you should be focusing on when there are zero students in school. I cannot emphasize that <laughs> enough. Um, and then when it comes to masks, I think, I think you're right. Uh, the, the school districts and the, and the leaders of schools have been far more risk averse than they should have been yeah. and, uh, to the detriment of many children. And as a result, a lot of people are very dedicated again, like I said, to these mitigation measures, they're sort of emotional about it. There is a mask p- 
a mask punitive culture. Yes. Right. In many schools. And that's not fair to children. Uh, my children are, are newly unmasked as of several weeks ago. Thank you, Governor Glenn Youngkin. Uh, and look, I had to wrestle with the idea of, am I sending them in maskless because of a statement I'm making? Am I sending them because uh, because I believe it's the right thing to do, which I do. I, I don't think they're at risk or putting anybody else at dang- in danger. Uh, and do I want to put them on the front lines of this argument, which is so unfair that we're doing them that to them just as a society. And uh, I talking points to them. I said, <laughs> I said, here's what, here's what you say, girlies. <laughs> now I know you'll be surprised once again that in, in addition to being in addition to being very social, uh, they are also talkers. Yeah. Um, and they are bold. So both of them were like, oh, no, we're going on mask. Like, no question about it. Really? They didn't I, they didn't hesitate. They they That's were. Interesting. And I didn't push them. I, ju- I just said, like, which way do you want to go? And they were like, it wasn't like we got to stick it to the man. They were just were like, we'd really prefer to not wear them. And we've been pretty consistent telling them the masks aren't helping you guys. Like, this is not a thing that's a real a real helpful tool. Um, so they said yes. And I told them, okay, here's what we do. Anybody asks you, you say, look, uh, this is the choice that my family is making. And we feel like we can make that choice safely, both for us and for you. And other people can make different choices. And that's fine. It, it, Libertarian I, mama over I, here. <laughs> I, I think that is really that is really sound advice. Where I hesitated on telling my kids that the masks weren't really helping them. Yeah. Because, you know, they, they don't want to wear, they, they, you know, all their masks are like novelty, you know, Batman, Spider-Man, yes, you know, we had those they're these too. thin, like cloth masks. And where I hesitated on telling them, I didn't want, I didn't want them to think that we were morons or that their <laughs> school, the people running their school were more, I, I didn't want them to think that all the adults in their lives were morons for making them yes. do something that wasn't helping them. So I sort of mm-hmm. hesitated on, on telling them the full reality. Now, and since the mask mandate here has been lifted on two of my four kids, I have really encouraged him because I think for my kindergarten, I mean, he's learning how to read. Yeah. I, I, I think this is an issue. I mean, not being able to see I your face, your mouth move, the yeah. the, the muzzling of the sounds. I, it's a huge problem. And uh, my oldest son has some learning differences. And I know what we went through yeah. on, on making sure he could learn how to read. Had we been doing that with him during a uh, – uh, I tell you, I, it's um, – anyway. No, I have, I have similar – like we have we – have, uh, challenges with, uh, with my firstborn. Uh, and luckily I homeschooled her. Mm. Uh, I saw the writing on the wall in this County. And I was like, ah, this went so badly during the spring. And also this is, this gets to your point about seeing faces and the importance of them. Many things that we were told for many years about how child development worked have just been sort of abandoned during the pandemic. And we've been told to believe something exactly opposite. For instance, putting your first grader on uh, zoom for a day is a great idea. No, it's not terrible. You've told me that you told me that screens for my children are a bad idea for a long time. I concur with that evidence, which was given to me earlier. You cannot switch it right now. Same with the seeing faces and language development and reading. So I kept my kids home. And I think that was the saving grace uh, for both my kids, but especially for my oldest. So I, I, I sympathize, uh, with that point of view. And for so many people, I mean, they were in this area and this is like, this area is really out of hand in many, in many ways. Uh, in one of the school districts here, I knew a family who had a fifth grader with special needs and she had an aide who is charged with working with her one-on-one in person in a normal year, right? She has an individual education plan, an IEP Anybody who has a kid who has learning challenges knows, knows this term. Yep. And she is legally required to be provided with that IEP. Again, there was a grace period at the very beginning of the pandemic, but nobody worked to get her back in a position where she got the services she needed. In fact, the school district forbade her aid from coming to her house because she had volunteered to do so. And that was against their policy and it would make it look like they could, could be doing things in person. Uh, that level of sort of adversarial relationship with parents and with students, parents didn't know that existed before. That was that was something that was something new for them. The the greatest thing that happened out of all this, I'm convinced, is that, and I'm one of them. This this gave all parents a real window into exactly what's being taught in the classrooms because they we yeah. all sat on the zooms. 
it gave them a real window into how administrators think of children versus think of them running some kind of, you know, factory for the benefit of a teacher's union as opposed to the children. I mean, it, it gave us all a real window into this. And I don't yes. think people are going to forget it. We're and voting not only, accordingly. Not only do those people have those feelings about kids and about how they run things, but the extent to which that group think quiets really good actors within a school system yes. is very real. I can't I can't get a teacher to talk to me to save my life, right? <laughs> because yeah, they live in fear. That she knows that her job, she or he yeah. knows that, that their jobs are at risk if they do that and that the unions will come down on them in a very serious way. Where's all the anti-bullying when you need it, right? Uh, you know, when when they lifted the mask mandate in my the one public school where my kids go, the the, the email that we got from the superintendent, it was like 10,000 words. It was the most <laughs> yes. tortured, you know, we looked at this and I'm really sorry, but I mean, it was this tortured. And then the last line was, and that's why from now on, we're just going to have a simple mask recommendation. He wouldn't even say I'm lifting the mandate. It said, well, we'll just have a mask recommendation. It Nowhere in it did it say we're lifting this because you could tell he lives in fear. Yeah. Of the of the uh, the mask uh, police. I, it, it, it's l let me let me change topics. because I think this, these are related. Yes. Do you, I want to talk about journalism and I want to talk about media. And I want to <laughs> ask you a question. Do you consider yourself today? I, I think you did. And you come from a long line of journalists. Do you consider yourself today a journalist? Is that your job title that you give people? Uh, so I'm more of a commentator. However, I should aspire to be more of a journalist because I think, uh, that the, the reporting part of my work, which I used to do more full time, uh, is really worthwhile. And it's, uh, and it's something that I think, uh, uh particularly on the, on the right, uh, we can get lazy about, right. We wanna, yeah. Like opinion is easy. Um, now I'm lucky that I've, I'm in a position where I think my, my, my takes, my takes, <laughs> yeah, my, opinion, hot takes. Um, my hot takes set me apart from a group and I think are useful for that reason. Um, however, uh, I do like to, to, to put on my journalist cap sometimes. And like I reported on, um, this Chinese dissident, uh, who, whose art was censored at George Washington university, mm -hmm. um, a couple weeks ago. I think those stories are important and they, the free speech kind of stuff, uh, the more coverage it gets, the, the, the more light we shine on that, uh, the less likely it's going to spread, uh, particularly even Chinese Communist Party influenced censorship on American universities. Like this is a bad thing. The more light we give that, the better. So I, I like to put on my journalist hat uh, and I'm trying to do it more often. I am, um, you know, I, you and I are both CNN people and I, um, I, you know, we're commentators, you know, our job is to go on and, and give our authentic opinion, but I, I take great care to never say anything that I, think isn't fully grounded in some kind of fact. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I have opinions and I give those opinions, but when I form them, I take great care of it because I, I care deeply about the idea that I think when people look at us, they think of us as journalists. I mean, we, yes. we think of ourselves as, as commentators, I guess, but, but I think the, the viewers look at us as journalists. And so I, I take great responsibility for that, but I'm, I'm curious about your views on whether you think that's a minority opinion in our, uh, in what we do, or whether you think, there are people out there who who use these kinds of positions to create narratives instead of things that are based on actual facts that are happening. I have my thoughts, but yeah. I'm, I'm curious if yours. No, I, I think we have an incentive problem uh, and it happens on both sides of the aisle. But I'll talk like I'm I'm in the sort of mainstream legacy media where there's group think to start. Right. There's yeah. too many people who agree. And the incentive is to agree. The incentive the incentive is never to disagree. Uh, it's not to test these ideas. It is to get in line, to pitch stories that fit with what we're doing and to, to go outside of that is uncomfortable. And to go outside of that probably means that you're not getting as many bylines or you're not getting as many appearances, right? And so the incentives are very bad. I think some journalists know that they are crafting narratives and some are just doing the thing that everyone else is doing. Yeah. But I think it's, I think it's really detrimental. I mean, I sat for four years or however long it took, uh, two and a half years of the Mueller report saying, I mean, I'd prefer to wait until we have the yeah. evidence before we start declaring this man, a, a, uh, the duly elected president annoyed faces, the duly <laughs> elected president, <laughs> of the United States of being a, a Russian plant, uh, maybe let's just like get to the end of this. And I feel like we're making our conclusions and then filling in the, 
the path to get there. And the Mueller report comes out and I go, this is what I've been saying. Right. Uh, but it took it took being a weirdo to to look at that differently because the incentive was the conclusion is this. We're going to unprecedent this president because we don't like him. Yep. How are we going to do it? How are we going to do it? And uh, and then the and, minute you the minute you raise these issues, somebody sitting near you says, well, you can either you can either uh, agree with us or you can be against democracy. You you pick, <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, that, I mean, th these were the, the choices that you had. You can either fall in line or be against democracy. I mean, this yeah, is no, how it, they set an, people up. It's an unhealthy way to discuss <laughs> things. Uh, yeah. And I, I think to your journalist question, my the thing I want to do most is to be an honest broker. And yeah. I think that's what you're saying as well. Like I, I I'm out there, you know, you know what my opinions are, right? You know what my position is. You can gauge my analysis based upon that. Uh, I think that is useful to people. And that also doesn't mean I can't do reporting and the reporting can be true. Uh, what will happen often is that I will pick different stories. For instance, I'm, I'm right now chasing down this IEP problem in these schools that closed uh, how children with disabilities and learning challenges lost their legally required services um, and what the learning loss is going to look like for the next decade going yeah. forward, possibly more. Uh, and I don't think that in legacy media circles, that is often a discussion because a lot of those folks, kids were in private schools that were open. They didn't experience the public school problem. Uh, and because of ideological alliances to unions and Democrats, they don't really want to get too deep into the details of that. So if my different perspective gives me a look into that story that I think needs to be told, I will tell that story and I will tell it with facts. Do you, um, I assume you, you share the same distress that I have, that it's, it is a real problem for America that, that legacy media, that the institution of media in general is held in such low esteem by our population. It should be held in high esteem. And we, I know, we need but they a, deserve it. We need a trusted, free and fair press. But you're you're sort of identifying the reasons why it is held in low esteem. And I think yeah. and so I guess you, you've, you've had so many different jobs. You've written for newspapers. You've you've done, you know, online reporting. You've been on TV. You do. You just, you're, you're across the, the landscape. You were on The View, which I have to ask you about The View in a minute. Do you is there a redeeming moment? for the industry of media. I mean, I think that's, we, we sit around and bemoan the fact that it has low trust levels. Can right. it be restored or, or are we doomed to sort of a landscape of fragmentation in a, from a shattered industry? Well, so people ask me about this all the time because of course, and this is a, this is a symptom of the problem. People will say, oh, well, when she, so I used to work for Fox. Yeah. When she left Fox, she sold out, right? <laughs> right? That's that's the calculation because I can't be anywhere else and still believe the things I believe. So that's a symptom of the problem because uh, everyone is perceived as having this over overweening narrative and that I have to fit into it. Well, I don't fit into it <laughs> yeah. um, on purpose. And that's that's why I want to be in places where I need to speak about that and that where I need to put a different uh, voice on things and give people's a voice at that table. Um, and one of the reasons I work in media at all is because I come from a journalist, journalism family. My father was a newspaper editor, uh, in our hometown and it was in a fight with another Metro daily. So I lived in a newspaper battle house at new, the news was very important <laughs> in our house. Um, and journalism has been important to me. I think it's important function of democracy, obviously. And my position in media is basically help me help you. Yeah. Please help me help you because I care about what we're doing here. And I would like for us to do it in a way that makes people trust us. Um, but increasingly, I find that that uh, I'm not sure that's the path anyone's ever going to take because I don't think it's I'm not sure it's profitable, right? right. Which becomes an issue um, in, a, in a sort of clickbait social media world. Uh, people love their silos. Yeah, even they do. though I preach all, even though I preach all the time, like you gotta get out of it. I mean, I spend maybe a little too much time outside my silo. I'd like to be more in my silo sometimes. Uh, <laughs> but, but I think it's really valuable for people to, to test their ideas, to know people who disagree with them, to know that that doesn't make those people monsters. Um, and yet, I feel that we are increasingly careening toward less and less trust. And by the way, one of the things that people get mad about and that they don't trust media about is because 
media seems to go and find the things that we actually do trust and like and just try to destroy them. Yeah. Like people are like, oh, uh, we listen to Joe Rogan because I don't know, it just seems like interesting. And he has different people who think different things. And I don't know, it doesn't seem that agenda driven. And he's kind of interesting. And they're like, that Must sounds like a problem to us. Yeah, that's right. That sounds like a problem to us. Uh, so I think the more <laughs> that media uh, becomes instead of an informative institution, uh, an institution that is engaged in telling people what they can and cannot say and what they can and cannot think, the less trust they will get. Are you, uh, are you worried about sort of this rise of, of, I mean, it's authoritarianism. It's, it's, I mean, there's probably other terms for it, but I feel deeply that there is a rise in this country of people who are absolutely dedicated to making sure that if you hold a contrary opinion, that not yeah. only should you you be personally destroyed, but but those opinions shouldn't even be allowed. No, it's in the public out, square. Man. It it is it is, <laughs> and and you know I, I always ascribe it to the left as I, I think I think this this streak exists in the left. I mean I don't know about you. Whenever I raise my head up out of the ditch and say something, you know I immediately get the why is Scott Jennings allowed to say these things on television? These things should be you know that's <laughs> yes. the that's the by far if if you look at all the comments I get. Number one, by far, why is this person allowed to speak? That's the number one. So the streak is there. You do see it on the right. Yes. Among yeah. the Trump people. I think uh, his his hardest core supporters do not think any Republican should be allowed to express a contrarian view. Wh why do you think that is? Why, why do you think this streak to stamp out speech has come to America today? I mean, we sort of resisted this right. for 200 years. Well, no, I, so I think we're the unfortunately, we're, we're the best of the best, right? We're, yeah. <laughs> even in the sad state of affairs, our country has special protections and not just special protection. Cause I always, I always tell college students and, and liberals who want to tell me that the speech is very dangerous. Um, I say like, they're like, Oh no, no, this isn't censorship because it's not the government. Okay. All right. Sure. Let's grant you that. Uh, the first amendment is the least we should be doing for speech in this country. The idea is that you actively embrace free speech, freewheeling speech. Yes, irresponsible speech, sometimes hateful speech, because yeah. that speech is protected. And if that speech is not protected, then no speech is protected. That's how this works. Uh, but we have really lost sight of that. And I think you see, uh, first of all, I'm, thank I'm so thankful for the First Amendment. Uh, I wish that uh, a lot of people in the press although they say they love it, would uh, would embrace it more fully in a social way as well in inviting new ideas. I think uh, some of this, this clamp down with the Emergencies Act in Canada is a real canary in the coal mine for how badly this can go when you don't have yeah. a First Amendment and real protections. Uh, and I and I'm that one's that one's creeping me out quite a bit. The uh, the financial powers given to the federal government of Canada by the Emergencies Act, uh, which have no recourse until after they've acted upon you based on your political speech by shutting off your bank account. It's crazy. That's pretty creepy, guys. It's I keep crazy. my alarmism like pretty pretty low most of the time. That's pretty creepy, and the number of people who think it's fine is an issue. Uh, and look, I think that people are tribal and that agree, like shutting down other opinions is, is frankly more fun than listening to them sometimes. <laughs> right. Uh, it's like a shortcut to winning your argument, right? We have resisted that for a long time, but we are getting less good at resisting it. And I think people have lost sight of what the true value of free speech is. And so they're like, well, what's the cost of shutting off people that I don't like? That seems like, that seems Okay. And uh, and it's really not. And eventually it will come for you in some form. That's the uh, that's that's the the tail end of this is right now. Uh, the people who want to shut you off uh, all tend to be congregated here and the people they want to shut off are over here. Shoes could be on other feet in the blink of an eye. And, well, and uh, I, I say all the time because people, you know, I always admonish conservative organizations. Look, you don't want to demonize and invalidate uh, an entire movement's feelings about policy or society based upon the fact that there are always going to be ad ac bad actors among any movement, right? Now, I think the truckers have been actually quite uh, quite well behaved. Uh, yes, well, attempt. they didn't burn any buildings down, right. so there's, there's a, this, for starters. <laughs> there's this attempt to do basically oppo research campaign on them so you can find something bad about them. 
we should have allowances for civil disobedience for some bad actors within a movement that includes Black Lives, Black Lives Matter while not invalidating that movement and not trying to punish the entire movement and people who are, yes, even at January 6th, outside at a rally and doing nothing unlawful. In fact, doing something that is protected, right? Like out on this in this free speech part of this endeavor. Right. Um, we need to draw those lines and we need to be careful about how we do it. And if you do invalidate an entire movement uh, based on bad folks and then just say that we should start rounding them up and their finances up, that's a bad move. That's a bad move for everyone. Yeah, it's uh, the fact that it's happening literally right next door. I mean, if this were happening halfway around the world, maybe you wouldn't think much about it. But yeah. I think most Americans think of Canadians as basically, you know, like us, just, <laughs> you know, north. And, uh, and yes. it's not they don't have the same protections we do. But the, but the impulse, it's it's the human impulse to to go down this road that is, is I think, the scariest. I think there's a loss of a cultural understanding of the value of free speech. And I think that's we still have the protection lawfully. But if it's not protected as a cultural norm, then you get into more problems. Well, th this is a this is a growing issue, right? Because at some point in the last few years, somebody decided speech and violence are the same thing, that speech is dangerous, Not that true. if I say something to you that you don't like, I have I have essentially right. physically assaulted you with my words. Right. And so it's easy to get from that to the, well, these are weapons, so we should be able to confiscate the weapons and uh, right. and shut out the weapons manufacturers. I mean, this is that's that worldview. And and I used to think of it as a fringe view, but the uh, I, the expansion of it is alarming. Yeah. And look, I think we all struggle with this, particularly as public figures to be responsible, right, in the way that we're communicating. And I think your your Courier Journal uh, column about Quintez Brown and about uh, and about other movements who that end up and activists who resort to violence sort of goes through the exercise of walking this line about how do we how do we make sure that our movements are healthy and that our rhetoric is not driving people insane. <laughs> Right. But also protect that speech because that speech is not violence. Right. Violence is violence. Speech is speech. These are different things. And everybody yeah, wants to call everything incitement, by the way. Everything is not incitement. No, it is not. And uh, and and I but but everyone's too afraid to say, suck it up. I mean, I'm sorry. You don't like what somebody said. Just you know what? People people do things I don't like every day. But that doesn't mean, you know, when we walk out your front door that you're walking into a, you know, a virtual war zone. I mean, yeah. people, people say things I disagree with all the time, but you, but there is a, it's just this culture of people who are constantly looking to be victimized. Like they, you know, they're right. looking for someone to say something so that they can say they were a victim of those words. It's uh, what well, And there's, there's weird. cultural cachet in saying you were victimized by someone else's <laughs> speech, especially if that person's very famous or funny, like Dave Chappelle, right? Like there's like, you get a <laughs> right. lot of, you get a lot of juice um, as opposed to just saying like, eh, I didn't love the comedy special, right? Like that, that's an option. Um, a, a, a lost art is just telling people, particularly young people, uh, your concerns are noted. Yeah. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Uh, we don't do enough of that. And I think uh, school administrators and uh, newsroom runners, editors and such, who run scared from their young uh, colleagues, do everyone a do disservice. The people who buy... Uh, or buy and consume the media, uh, the students and or young employees involved, uh, and all the other employees who have to work with those employees. At some point, there has to be a grown up in the room and the grown up has to say, we're going to have some people who disagree. And yeah. I see less and less ability uh, for adults to be that. And I, that sounds a little condescending sometimes. But I when you have a like on on a college campus, Reason Magazine reported on this, like, a, a list of 17 something uh, helplines for who to call if someone's speech hurt you. That's a real thing on a real college campus. Now that you may say that's like the weird outlier. It ain't that much of an outlier. No. When you have that situation, I have trouble saying anything, but you got to suck it up, man. You got to suck it up. <laughs> Mary Catherine Ham is our uh, guest on the Flyover Country podcast. Uh, we uh, are coming down near the end of our time. There's a couple other things I wanted to ask you about. You were talking about having some people in the room who are going to disagree. You were that person in the room uh, as you co-hosted The View after uh, Meghan McCain's departure. And I, I tweeted the other day and I because uh, I thought, it. you know, they're trying to find a conservative to sit in this show. Mm -hmm. I don't actually think they want a conservative <laughs> to be on the show. I think they they need to say they, but they don't actually want someone to disagree. You were in the room, 
you were the one person there to disagree. I, I loved reading the reactions to what you had to say. I was just curious to know how did how was the experience? What was it like? I mean, obviously, the most recent news out of the view was Whoopi Goldberg's extraordinary idiocy as in trying to discuss <laughs> uh, historical matters recently. How, how did you find it? I mean, what what was your experience? So, like? so the way I look at it is that um, first of all, I always I've I've done it twice I think it was a long time ago the other time I did it but I always have a pleasant experience right mm -hmm. partly because I love a live audience I'm like yeah yeah you came here to hate me but you're not gonna leave hating me <laughs> um so that's part of it but also it's it is a to me it is a fun challenge to be on a set with a bunch of people who are going to disagree with me that's why I do my job uh and it's difficult because especially on in a, in a place like The View you're sometimes talking about um an issue where the setup for the segment, the premise of the segment is exactly the opposite of what you think, right? And to turn that around and to make cogent an argument from a different point of view with four other people there who disagree with you can be very, very hard to do, but I find joy in it. <laughs> and I, oh, it's like obvious. I said, like I said, I want to, and I want to give a voice to people uh, who are not usually represented in that space. So for instance, on The View, I brought, uh, we had a chance to highlight somebody who had been brave and resilient during the pandemic. And I highlighted the family of this special needs, of the, with the special needs daughter, uh, fifth grader, who had been kept out of school for a year mm -hmm. so that I could highlight this issue and this problem for all families in this area, not Democratic families, not Republican families, uh, that would otherwise be overlooked because people tend toward the teacher and, and trusting teachers and unions as opposed to listening to the parent side of this story. So that's a victory for me, right? And it's a victory for me and for, I think, a lot of other people who would agree with me when I get to stick up for, like, the national anthem, when everyone else is saying, like, boo-boo, like, like everyone, everybody kneel. That, again, you're welcome to that opinion, but let me, let me embody the many, 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 so many other people who disagree with this idea. Right. So I enjoy that. And I hope I get another shot at it. We'll see. Yeah, I, uh, I, I I'm just dubious that ultimately they because I, I think ultimately people are looking at this like we we have, we have spent years cultivating an audience that wants one thing. And if we put something on the shelf that the audience doesn't want to buy, then, you right. know, I, I and it it's terrible. But I, I think they look at it through that lens more than they look at it through the discourse lens, uh, which I don't know, we'll see. We'll see. What well, they I do. am always available for. <laughs> The discourse. There's nobody. I mean, <laughs> truly, there's nobody better. And uh, they really should have hired you already. And I, I don't know if you if you if you have it within you to go do it every day. But uh, well, I'll always give it a try. We'll we'll say uh, Mary Catherine, you have been a terrific guest. Before you go, I have to subject you to the thing we subject all the guests to. And that is the famous lightning round. And so okay. uh, these are short answer or one answer only. So I'm going to start with number one. What was a greater thrill for you? Being uh, commented on by Donald Trump, who said, she's not a fan of mine. I've never gotten along with her. I don't know her. She says only bad things. Let's cross her name off the list. Or the Georgia Bulldogs winning the national championship. I mean, we got to go with the dogs, obviously. <laughs> by the way, we got to show off my, these are my Coke bottles up here. Uh, a, two, a 1980, which my husband bought for me because he's a sweetheart. Oh, and great. a 2022 up on the shelf up there. Unbelievable. Amazing. The dogs, finally. I was nine months old when they won their last championship. Incredible. Incredible team. All right, that's number apologies one. Apologies to the former press. Number two, we'll stay on presidential politics. Uh, it's a two-parter. Will Donald Trump be the Republican nominee in 2024? I'm going to say no. Will Joe Biden be the Democratic nominee? No. So you're predicting an all new, who knows, matchup. It's interesting. You know what, some, I will admit this. Sometimes in my analysis, I predict things as I wish they would be instead yeah. of as they might actually be. But it's too far out to know at this point. So let's go with no on both. Your prediction, though, is squarely in line with where I think 80 percent of America is. They would strongly prefer two different candidates. And uh, we'll, we'll see if the parties. I mean, I would just to prefer it. two, two non-boomers. Could we do that? <laughs> non Elderlies. I have I have some boomers in my life who I love very much, but on the presidential front, we could. We could if you could, if you could just like, if, if if you could like prescribe who you who you want yeah. the race. What would be the most interesting race? What Democrat and Republican would give America the most interesting race from a most just a conversational race. perspective? Uh, burr, 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 um, well, DeSantis Harris would just be fun to watch. It would be a fun race. 
<laughs> but I'm not sure that qualifies as interesting. I think yeah. it, I think there'd be a lot of cringe. Yeah. Um, I don't know for the Democrat. I think I think Polis in Colorado and the mayor of New York City are both interesting for different reasons, but they're interesting yeah. in the way they act. And I think on the I agree with you, uh, particularly about Polis, who, um, you know, I was out in Colorado recently and I was telling telling folks like, no, you don't understand. You, They're all conservatives. Right. So they're like, oh, no, Jared Polis, boo. And I'm like, no, no, no. You don't understand how much better he's been <laughs> than so many other Democratic yeah. governors. And I think he recognized from the beginning that there would be a constituency for normalcy. Yes. And it has served him well. I think on the Republican side, if you if you're just going for pure sort of what's going to make for an interesting race that that could cause people's heads to explode. I mean, Tim Scott, if the Republicans nominate, you know, one of the most articulate and uh, thoughtful sort of policy driven people in, in Tim Scott, it, it, the, the amount of head explosions yeah. on the left and, and in the media would be would be amazing. Right. But it would like make for Scott an interesting conversation. Like a Scott Haley ticket. Oh, my gosh. People would have a <laughs> meltdown. And uh, I think it'd be a pretty good ticket for the Republicans. Uh, let's see. When you're on television, favorite Democrat sparring partner? Oh, um, well, I first I have to do a, a throwback honor to my friend Juan Williams, who I miss very much. Uh, we spent many years today together at Juan Williams. Um, I mean, at, uh, Fox, at Fox News together. And then, oh, you know who I enjoy? And she's not on as much anymore. Angela Rye and I always used to have fun. Mm. Yeah, I don't, uh, what happened to Angela? She's not on a ton anymore. You know what? She dated Common, and she's like another level of famous now. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that, she doesn't. That's probably she doesn't escaping to, my Google. I don't think the algorithm serves me the. Uh, <laughs> I I get served news. this important news, um, but she doesn't need to. <laughs> she didn't need to like uh, to to slum with the likes of me anymore. But uh, but we used to have. She has a sense of humor. Uh, she is uh, interesting on on camera. Makes interesting arguments, and I think has has a a bit of a libertarian streak where both of us are like, are we trusting the FBI and everything it says? Why are we trusting the FBI and everything it says? Uh, so I appreciate that in a sparring partner. Uh, let's see. You go to a lot of university towns. You've talk, spoken at a lot of college campuses. Which college town is your favorite to visit? Well, I mean, Athens, number one. Of course. Obviously, Athens, Georgia. Um, because I think a southern college town is the best of blue and red America. Like you get a you get a lot of good sushi and a lot of good music. Yep. Also a lot of good good barbecue and low taxes. Like it's a. <laughs> it's everything. Yeah. Um, but let's see. Places I love being. Um, I mean, I've done the Harvard thing. Yep. It's a little cold for me, but a lovely place. <laughs> it is a lovely Actually, place. I, went, I did University of Chicago for a bit, and that was super fun. Lots to see in Chicago. Also too cold. See, this is what, this is what, this is my issue. I got to be down in the South. <laughs> yeah. 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 These, uh, I've, I've spent a fair number of semesters at Harvard uh, during the, the, the supposed spring semester is, uh, it doesn't turn into spring until, uh, Not so much. May or, or June, you know? All right. Final question. Not political. Just you've had three children. You've been mm -hmm. through it three times. What is the best advice you were given when you started out? And what is the best advice you would dispense today to people who are on the brink of having children? Okay, number one, read for women, especially the husbands can join in as well because it's good to have this information. Read Expecting Better by Emily Oster. She is an economist at uh, Brown University. She's great and she breaks down what you actually should be nervous about while you're pregnant and what you shouldn't be nervous about while you're pregnant. She has also done two further books that are about toddlerhood and then getting into school and all those things. I'm sure those are helpful as well. I have not read them yet because I have three children as... <laughs> So I like missed the chance to educate myself. So while you're pregnant, do that. Um, and then the best advice I got. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I think early on, someone told me to uh, someone told me to travel with them when they're little. Uh, especially very little because they're easier on planes. Yeah. Uh, so if you have the chance to take a trip and you have a young baby and you have only have one baby, and you have a helper even on the plane in a spouse or a family member, take that trip because it's the easiest that it gets basically. And the more practice you get at doing that, the braver you will get. And so I do all sorts of crazy things with my kids now. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, that the older they get and the more stuff they accumulate and the more of them you have, I mean, you, you it's like being on the Oregon trail and you need a Conestoga yes. wagon to carry all the, yes. uh, all the accoutrement. The best advice I ever got was swaddling. I had never heard of swaddling, but I went to a parenting like thing and uh, 
They were like, listen, your grandparents are going to hate this. They're going to tell you that you're abusing these children. But if you will wrap these children up as tightly as you possibly can, mm -hmm. they will sleep. And it was the best advice I ever got. I learned how to do it expertly. I tell everybody that's having a baby. I tell every father, like, to learn the swaddle. If you could become the yeah. swaddling Jedi. That I also feel like that's a great way for dad to contribute. Like yes. there's a there's a time in there when mom's like really yes. in charge of everything that's going on. And if you can be that extra set of hands to do the tight swaddle, that's that's your that's your lane. That's a great lane to be in. <laughs> oh, man. If you uh, it, it will strengthen your marriage if you can yes. uh, <laughs> if you could contribute. All right. Mary Catherine, thank you. You've been a terrific guest. Thank you. You're, you, you are uh, you are a. Uh, inspiration to many of us who uh who are in this space and uh, we follow you closely and um we hope to actually have you back here in the very near future because we're uh, i will come back can i plug a few things real quick absolutely what, okay, you, yes, you what can, are we plugging look, tell me you can you can follow me at mk hammer on twitter at mk hammer time on substack where i write and instagram where you can see pictures of my dog and my kids um <laughs> And, uh, and I have my own podcast now. It's called Getting Hammered. You can find it wherever you find podcasts. Getting Hammered. I'm not always hammered when I do the podcast, but, you know, sometimes I might be. <laughs> this is great. I got to – I uh, um, I didn't even ask you about we'll, – we'll end it here, but I, I, I want to talk to you about this Substack business because I have started to, like, uh, subscribe to people. And I have to tell yeah. you, I, I love this business model for for people. It's uh, – you get you get really good stuff out there. It's, uh, it's an it's industry-busting it thing. It, to me, it gives people like us, the weirdos, mm. a real outlet to say like, hey, <laughs> I, I'm not always given an opportunity to say these things on my other platform, but here I can say them. So and the I think the Matt Taibis of the world are, and Barry Weiss, they're just doing great work. Yeah, 100 percent. Mary Catherine Hammer is our guest. You're on the Flyer of a Country podcast. Thanks for being with us. We'll have a roundtable coming up after the president's State of the Union uh, next week. So. Don't miss it, and uh, join us again. Flyover Country with Scott Jennings. Thanks for listening. Flyover Country with Scott Jennings is a production of Bluegrass Media Lab, coming to you from the heart of Middle America, Louisville, Kentucky. If you like what you heard, subscribe to Flyover Country on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you find your favorite podcasts.